These mysteries from the ancient past show we still have a lot to learn about the people who came before us. Around the world, there have been many unique cultures that all had stories worth sharing. But unfortunately, the details of many of those stories may be lost forever. Our current understanding of human history suggests that the ancient Sumerians were the first to use a writing system. The cuneiform script was created around 3500 BC and used around the Near East. But according to some scholars, there was a writing system used in Europe that predates even this ancient writing. The Vinca culture was an important civilization that existed between 5700 and 4500 BC. It was a complex society that existed throughout the Balkans, with the majority of the culture lying in modern-day Serbia and Kosovo. In some ways, it was a descendant of the lipinski Vera culture that had existed thousands of years earlier but had many other influences as it was spread over such a wide area. The culture is named after the Belgrade suburb of Vinca, where the first artifacts from this civilization were discovered in 1908. The Vinca occupied the site for roughly 300 years and left behind a wealth of archaeological evidence, including figurines and the foundations of their homes. Many of the figurines created in the later years of the occupation were inscribed with strange markings that had never been seen before. This was the second time modern scholars had been presented with what's now called the Vinca script or Vinca symbols. The symbols were first discovered in 1875 at the Romanian site of Tordos. Archaeologists there found pottery marked with symbols. Over the next 140 years, Roughly 1,000 artifacts with the Vinca symbols have been located, but figuring out what the markings are has left researchers baffled. Some believe the symbols are ancient letters from a long-forgotten writing system. The little pictograms do somewhat resemble the markings that would eventually become cuneiform in Sumeria. But the significance of the similarities is debated, and it's not commonly believed that cuneiform evolved from the pictograms. The problem with the idea that this is a writing system is just how short most of the inscriptions are. 85% of the inscriptions consist of only a single symbol, and many of the symbols are not repeated. One-sixth of the symbols used are described as comb or brush patterns, and may represent numbers. Most of the symbols are found on pots, which were used in trade around the Vinca culture. Others were found on small tablets or inscribed on figurines, like those located in the Vinca suburb. One story is that the symbols might have been used to represent a god or gods, which would indicate a cuneiform culture throughout the Vinca lands, and one that didn't change much over time. This would be strange. Even the famous Greco-Roman gods changed considerably from place to place and over time periods. The symbols might also have been simple images of what was stored in a pot or desired during a ritual offering of the figurines. This would make the symbols a sort of proto-writing, it never developed into a full writing system, though, as the Vinca civilization declined in around 4500 BC, and the use of the symbols faded around a thousand years later. The Vinca symbols are very controversial in archaeology, with debates about exact dates as well as what the script was used for still ongoing. It's possible this mystery is one destined to never be solved. For years, the locals living in the Fusian Lake in China told legends of an underwater city that could be seen from the nearby mountains on clear days. It wasn't until 1992 that divers went beneath the water to confirm that something strange and mysterious did exist down there. It's the third deepest freshwater lake in the country, reaching a depth of 155 meters, and is home to many endemic species of fish. For centuries, the lake had an almost mystical quality to it. It's said that two emissaries from the Jade Emperor were so entranced by its beauty that they were turned into statues on the side of the lake. It's also said to be home of a winged horse, and there have been many UFO sightings from the area. The story of the lost city beneath the water was just another one of the folklore tales until 1992 when the truth was revealed. An experienced diver named Gang Wei went down into the water to try to find proof. He discovered a sunken city lying not far beneath the water, it was made out of stone with intricate carvings and artifacts scattered among them. Later research determined that the city was between 2.5 and 2.7 square kilometers in area, which would have made it larger than the capital of the Han Dynasty. 
It was made up of around 30 buildings, which were connected by cobblestone streets, as well as several pyramid-like structures. This was obviously an impressive and important find. Even beyond the size of the underwater city, the fact it was made of stone set it apart from what researchers were expecting to find. For such an advanced city to disappear beneath the water without any apparent mention in the historical record was very strange. There are reports of one city that disappeared in Chinese history. The Yuyon city had once sat at the northern shore of Fuxian Lake, before apparently vanishing without a trace. For a while, researchers believed they might have found the lost city of Yuyon, but the fact that the buildings were made of stone meant that was unlikely. Yuyon buildings had been made from clay and wood. Carbon dating of the artifacts found in the city determined that it sank around 1750 years ago. This was long before the last mention of Yuyon existed on land, suggesting that this isn't the lost city. Another hypothesis was that this was the capital of the ancient Dian Kingdom. However, the Dian Kingdom fell long before the artifacts found at the lost city were created, ruling out that as a possibility as well. For now, the identity of this mysterious city remains unknown, but experts are confident that with enough research and time, the truth may be revealed. In 2017, metal detectorists in Switzerland made a strange discovery that experts still haven't been able to understand. The two treasure hunters found something completely unique while searching near Lake Beale. They pulled a lump of cracked and worn metal from the ground. Also found at the site were a bladed object and a rib bone. After cleaning up the lump of metal, they realized just how intricate it was. It was a bronze hand, colored green after being exposed to the elements for thousands of years. Around the wrist was a band of gold. The objects were given to authorities the following day, and experts set about searching the location where the treasure had been discovered. There, they found one of the fingers that had become detached from the hand, other bronze artifacts, and the bones of a middle-aged male. At first, there were suspicions that this might have been a hoax. The hand was cast from a pound of bronze and was roughly the same size as a teenager's hand. Nothing like this had ever been found in Europe. The gold band around the wrist of the hand had been glued to the bronze using a vegetable-based glue. Scientists were able to carbon date the adhesive and found that it dated back to between 1400 and 1500 BC, and that places it in the Middle Bronze Age. Archaeologists discovered that the man had been buried on top of a stone structure, which is believed to date back even earlier. It was clear this was a very important person, but who he was remains a mystery. The purpose of the bronze hand is also a mystery. It's the oldest bronze piece representing a piece of the body that's ever been found, and the burial is very unique. It's not believed that the hand was worn by a person, but there is a cavity that would have allowed it to be placed onto something. It may have been part of a statue or a scepter. Neither of these objects have been discovered, though. Cracking the mystery of the man that the hand was buried with may solve this mystery of the purpose of this strange artifact. The Medicine Wheel in Bighorn National Forest, Wyoming, is one of the most impressive historical mysteries from North America. The main question surrounding the wheel is who created it? The Medicine Wheel is inaccessible for most of the year, with snow covering the structure. But in the summer months, the Wheel of Stones is visible on Medicine Mountain. The whole wheel has a diameter of roughly 80 feet. In the center is a cairn, a ring-shaped pile of rocks which is about 10 feet in diameter. 28 spokes connect the central cairn to the outer ring, and six more cairns lie along the outer edge of the ring. The rocks used in the structure are limestone and come from the surrounding areas. According to the Crow people, the tribe that lived on the land when Europeans arrived, the medicine wheel was already there when they arrived. They arrived at the site in roughly 1600, and the story goes that the leader of the tribe had a vision quest that made him realize that he had found their new home. One story told by a crow elder named Tom Yellowtail is that of a man named Burnt Face who was disfigured in an accident when he was young. Out of shame, he separated from the rest of the tribe and stayed in the area where the medicine wheel is today. He fasted, prayed, and built the medicine wheel. Eventually, he was approached by the little people who lived there, who healed his scars and sent him back to his tribe. In the story of Burnt Face, it specified that the door to the building he was creating looked towards the sun. The medicine wheel actually has many astronomical alignments. Two of the outer cairns, when lined up with the central cairn, line up with the rising and setting of the sun at the summer solstice, 
Other alignments of various cairns line up with the dawn risings of four of the brightest stars in the sky. This can be used to tell the exact date. All four are connected to the summer solstice in some way. The dawn rising of Fomalaut takes place 28 days before the summer solstice. Aldebaran has its dawn rising in two days before the solstice. Rigel has its 28 days after the solstice, and Sirius rises 28 days later. The exact date of the medicine wheel is hard to say. Estimates range from 300 to 800 years, while archaeologists have determined that the time period when the alignments were closest to being perfect was around 1200. The area of Medicine Mountain has also been an important place for Native Americans for thousands of years. Interestingly, it's also one of only 10 places on Earth called the Nuclei of Continents, a small patch of some of the oldest rocks on the planet. Who originally built the site may remain a mystery, but today it's an important site for many Native American groups who still practice various traditions and ceremonies in this important spiritual location. Some of the strangest historical mysteries are the locations of the final resting places of famous rulers that have been lost to history. While Egypt's Cleopatra and Macedonia's Alexander the Great are the most famous of these mysteries, Japan has its own mysterious figure with an unknown final resting place. Queen Himiko of Japan is a very mysterious figure. The oldest texts on Japanese history don't mention the ancient queen, but it's important to note that they were being written by people employed by the emperor, and Queen Himiko doesn't quite fit into the legendary story of the early days of the Yamato dynasty. The queen ruled between 180 and 248, a time period mostly covered by legendary stories in Japanese history. Everything we know about her comes from Chinese writing. According to Chinese records, Queen Himiko came to power after decades of war in the land of Wa, the name that they gave to Japan. Japan was split into many states at the time, but the one ruled by Himiko, Yamatai, became the most powerful under her rule. She sent envoys and tributes to the Chinese emperor and was given the title ruler of Wa, friend of Wei. In 247, she sent a request for support from the Wei, as there was a conflict with another state. The outcome of the conflict isn't known, but it's believed Queen Himiko passed away either that year or the year after. The queen was said to have mystical powers and was likely an important religious figure at the time. There is debate over how much of the ruling she actually did and how much fell to her brother, but the Chinese believed that she, rather than her brother, wielded great power. After the passing of Himiko, the land fell into another warring states period, and eventually the Yamato dynasty came to power. It's not known if the early Yamato emperors were related to Himiko. According to tradition, the Japanese emperors all descend from the sun goddess, and only one family has ruled since 660 BC. Of course, the first hundred years of that rule, including the time when Himiko would have been in power, are legendary, and it's likely that many states did exist across Japan at that time. It's possible that Himiko ruled in one area and Yamato emperors ruled in another. Interestingly, around the same time that Himiko was said to be in power, the legendary Yamato ruler is said to be Empress Jinju, the wife of the previous emperor who ruled as regent for her son until he was old enough to rule. It's possible Himiko and Jinju were the same person, but there are noticeable differences between the two women, and scholars believe that they were separate people. Where the land of Yamatai is remains a mystery although there are a few possible areas suggested by archaeologists. Unsurprisingly, the tomb of Queen Himiko is also missing. In 2009, archaeologists believe they had located the tomb in the town of Sakura. Carbon dating dates the tomb to around the time Himiko passed away. Unfortunately, further study is prohibited by the royal family of Japan, so whether this is Himiko's tomb remains a mystery. Some of the darkest moments of World War II take place in the claustrophobic quarters of a ship at sea. One especially cursed ship is the SS Alkimos, a ship built during the war under the emergency shipbuilding program. If the creepy backstories are true, then this ship was cursed from the beginning. Several workers became trapped and lost their lives in small compartments aboard the ship as their oxygen ever so slowly ran out. Shortly after its launch in October of 1943, the ship was reassigned and rechristened as Vigu Hanstein for 18 months of war service in the Mediterranean. 
The story gets creepier in August of 1944, when a Canadian radio operator had her life taken by another member of the crew, who then took his own life. The ship's dark history continued when weird stories of paranormal activity were reported on board, including ghost sightings. It was sold in 1953 to a Greek shipping company that renamed it Alchemos after a Greek god. But the creepy history associated with the Alchemos would eventually claim the ship itself. On March 20th, 1963, the Alchemos struck a reef near Beagle Island on a voyage from Jakarta to Bunbury. It was towed into Fremantle for repairs, but got impounded in May, only to be towed to Hong Kong for more repairs. Unfortunately, the tow line snapped early in the journey, and heavy winds drove it ashore, where the World War II ship was stranded for months of winter storms and left with a caretaker. During this time, the caretaker told stories about how they would hear voices that sent chills down their spine. When the Alchemos was finally towed away in January, the tug was seized by authorities and the Alchemos was left anchored, though the chain eventually broke and the ship drifted away, becoming seriously damaged. The ship was sold for scrap, but repeated fires drove the salvage workers off of the wreck. Oddly enough, the site of the Alchemos remains a popular diving venue today. Jack Su, the Chinese-Australian diver, also known for his service as a Z-Force commando in World War II, even wrote a book entitled Ghost of Alchemos, a collection of creepy anecdotes about the wreck. He claimed to have heard a ghost on the ship when he was in their bunk, a ghost making the sound of someone moaning in their sleep. The shipmates have similar scary stories, including one sighting of a figure dressed in sailor's clothes with blonde hair. The Alchemos may no longer be afloat, but it's disturbing to consider that Perth's famous ghost ship could still be haunted by unexplainable phenomena now, even underwater. Fort Leavenworth was built in the city of Leavenworth, Kansas in 1827. The first settlement in Kansas Territory, it's now the second oldest United States Army post west of Washington, D.C. Its weirdly dark history remains a largely untold story years later. In 1866, Fort Leavenworth was the base of the original Buffalo Soldiers, the nickname used by the Native American tribes to refer to black soldiers in the 10th Cavalry Regiment of the Army. As the Indian Wars slowly petered out, the fort became the home of what would eventually become the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College, a graduate school for military training. In the early 20th century, officers like Dwight D. Eisenhower, George S. Patton, and Omar Bradley graduated from the school between the two world wars. 19,000 officers completed courses there during World War II and the fort even became a National Historic Landmark in 1960. But in addition to the place's obvious historical significance, and its role in training so many soldiers that would go on to fight in World War II, Fort Leavenworth is also the site of some of the creepiest sightings. Many believe the place is one of the most haunted posts in America. Several old houses in the historic fort have been noted for the presence of strange sounds at night, some paranormal stories suggest the ghost of executed inmates haunt the fort. The general's residence at First Scott Avenue is said to be haunted by General George Armstrong Custer, who'd been seen roaming the first floor. Custer chose to remain at the base because he was court-martialed there in 1867 for the mistreatment of his troops. The rookery at 14 Summer Place is also considered one of the most haunted buildings at the fort, being the oldest on the base. One recurring ghost is that of a woman with long hair who claws at residents with her fingernails. Other paranormal stories include an elderly woman speaking in the corner, an old man with bushy hair, and a young girl screaming. Some suspect the old woman is Mary Pinckney Hardy MacArthur the mother of General Douglas MacArthur, who played a major role in the Pacific Theater during the history of World War II. Today, Fort Leavenworth is still visited for its haunted houses, but perhaps the scariest part of this story isn't the creepy apparitions seen on the military base, 
but rather the fort's long, brutal history. Places like this that have experienced intense events over the years are often the site of the most bone-chilling sightings. The Diplomat Hotel in the Philippines was originally built between 1913 and 1915 as a vacation house for American and Spanish friars from the Order of the Preachers, more commonly known as the Dominican Order. But the house, which was built at the top of Dominican Hill, took on more historical significance during World War II. At first, the place became a refuge for people fleeing from the Japanese until the Imperial Army eventually turned the property into their own headquarters. The secret police used the place for punishing priests, nuns, and refugees, often ending with the removal of their heads. In 1945, American troops liberated the Philippines and destroyed the old site, while the Japanese forces inside took their own lives. In 1973, almost 20 years later, Diplomat Hotels Inc. bought and remodeled the building, finally turning it into a hotel with 133 bedrooms, though architects kept some of the unique features chosen by the original friars. The hotel ceased operations after its manager passed away in 1987. Today, the abandoned building is remembered as a haunted hotel because of its scary history. In recent years, it's become an art center and tourist spot, and has been featured on Philippine news programs, including One at Heart with Jessica Soho. Visitors frequently come to remember the dark history of the place, sometimes hoping to leave with stories of paranormal encounters. Many visitors have claimed to see headless ghosts at night and hear strange noises like screaming, banging on doors, and crying. The building may have been remodeled and used for new purposes, but if the stories are true, then throughout all of history, the spirits of those who did not survive will linger behind those walls. One of the scariest episodes in the dark history of World War II happened following the Battle of Ambon, an event which occurred over the first few days of February of 1942. The Japanese army had attacked the island of Ambon in the Dutch East Indies, which is now Indonesia, and defeated the combined Dutch and Australian troops in a matter of days. The Allied forces didn't lose many people during the course of the battle. However, in the weeks following the surrender, the lives of over 300 Australian and Dutch prisoners of war were taken at random near the Laha airfield and buried in mass graves, an event now known as the Laha Massacre. Some surviving crew from a Japanese minesweeper sunk by a Dutch-laid mine in the Ambon Bay took part, suggesting this scary story was partly motivated by revenge. Three quarters of the captured Australians of Ambon lost their lives before the end of the war, and most survivors who remained on the island passed away soon after World War II. In 1946, one of the largest war crime trials took place, relating to the Laha Massacre as 93 Japanese soldiers were tried by an Australian military tribunal. One of the men was Commander Kunido Hatakayama, who was in command of the massacres, though he did not order them himself. He, like so many other high-ranking servicemen, was sentenced to capital punishment, and the rest were in prison. During the war, American propaganda in the media reached an all-time high. Some of the most dark and disturbing propaganda stories were aimed at the Japanese. Media often described them as yellow vermin, and an official U.S. Navy film called them living snarling rats. Such thinking especially took off in the wake of the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. These stories, intended to dehumanize the Japanese, were effective to a scary degree. Expert historians know from first-hand accounts by American servicemen that troops often made a habit of taking trophies from the bodies of Imperial Japanese soldiers. These morbid souvenirs often included teeth, ears, noses, and other parts. In some of the darkest moments of the war, the most common and scariest trophies were entire heads, which were boiled down to leave only a grinning visage beneath. These heads were regarded as treasures, each with their own secret horror story hidden within. 
It was not uncommon to find World War II bases covered with such dreadful decor. They were even mailed home to family with the cavalier attitude of a hunter showing off the antlers of a buck. In one of the weirdest and darkest moments of World War II history, on June 13, 1944, Francis E. Walter, a U.S. representative at the time, gifted President Franklin Roosevelt a letter opener fashioned from the bony remains of a Japanese soldier's arm. Roosevelt accepted the strange gift, supposedly commenting, this is the sort of gift I like to get. This strange but true history story led to outrage in both Japan and the U.S. civilian population. And several weeks later, Roosevelt ordered his letter opener to be given a proper burial. In fact, the taking of trophies had become such a problem that in September of 1942, the commander-in-chief of the Pacific Fleet warned that any American troops who continued to use part of the enemy's body as a souvenir would face stern disciplinary action. This was only loosely enforced, however, and the startling practice remained for years afterward. This weird history chapter would largely come to an end after most of the trophies were returned to Japan, but the search still continued many years later, and some remains have still never been recovered. Some of the darkest moments of World War II take place in the claustrophobic quarters of a ship at sea. One especially cursed ship is the SS Alkimos, a ship built during the war under the emergency shipbuilding program. If the creepy backstories are true, then this ship was cursed from the beginning. Several workers became trapped and lost their lives in small compartments aboard the ship as their oxygen ever so slowly ran out. Shortly after its launch in October of 1943, the ship was reassigned and rechristened as Vigu Hanstein for 18 months of war service in the Mediterranean. The story gets creepier in August of 1944, when a Canadian radio operator had her life taken by another member of the crew, who then took his own life. The ship's dark history continued when weird stories of paranormal activity were reported on board, including ghost sightings. It was sold in 1953 to a Greek shipping company that renamed it Alchemos after a Greek god. But the creepy history associated with the Alchemos would eventually claim the ship itself. On March 20th, 1963, the Alchemos struck a reef near Beagle Island on a voyage from Jakarta to Bunbury. It was towed into Fremantle for repairs, but got impounded in May, only to be towed to Hong Kong for more repairs. Unfortunately, the tow line snapped early in the journey, and heavy winds drove it ashore, where the World War II ship was stranded for months of winter storms and left with a caretaker. During this time, the caretaker told stories about how they would hear voices that sent chills down their spine. When the Alchemos was finally towed away in January, the tug was seized by authorities and the Alchemos was left anchored, though the chain eventually broke and the ship drifted away, becoming seriously damaged. The ship was sold for scrap, but repeated fires drove the salvage workers off of the wreck. Oddly enough, the site of the Alchemos remains a popular diving venue today. Jack Su, the Chinese-Australian diver, also known for his service as a Z-Force commando in World War II, even wrote a book entitled Ghost of Alchemos, a collection of creepy anecdotes about the wreck. He claimed to have heard a ghost on the ship when he was in their bunk, a ghost making the sound of someone moaning in their sleep. The shipmates have similar scary stories, including one sighting of a figure dressed in sailor's clothes with blonde hair. The Alchemos may no longer be afloat, but it's disturbing to consider that Perth's famous ghost ship could still be haunted by unexplainable phenomena now, even underwater. Fort Leavenworth was built in the city of Leavenworth, Kansas in 1827. The first settlement in Kansas Territory, it's now the second oldest United States Army post west of Washington, D.C. Its weirdly dark history remains a largely untold story years later. In 1866, Fort Leavenworth was the base of the original Buffalo Soldiers, 
the nickname used by the Native American tribes to refer to black soldiers in the 10th Cavalry Regiment of the Army. As the Indian Wars slowly petered out, the fort became the home of what would eventually become the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College, a graduate school for military training. In the early 20th century, officers like Dwight D. Eisenhower, George S. Patton, and Omar Bradley graduated from the school between the two world wars. 19,000 officers completed courses there during World War II, and the fort even became a National Historic Landmark in 1960. But in addition to the place's obvious historical significance and its role in training so many soldiers that would go on to fight in World War II, Fort Leavenworth is also the site of some of the creepiest sightings. Many believe the place is one of the most haunted posts in America. Several old houses in the historic fort have been noted for the presence of strange sounds at night. Some paranormal stories suggest the ghost of executed inmates haunt the fort. The General's residence at 1st Scott Avenue is said to be haunted by General George Armstrong Custer, who'd been seen roaming the first floor. Custer chose to remain at the base because he was court-martialed there in 1867 for the mistreatment of his troops. The rookery at 14 Summer Place is also considered one of the most haunted buildings at the fort, being the oldest on the base. One recurring ghost is that of a woman with long hair who claws at residents with her fingernails. Other paranormal stories include an elderly woman speaking in the corner, an old man with bushy hair, and a young girl screaming. Some suspect the old woman is Mary Pinckney Hardy MacArthur, the mother of General Douglas MacArthur who played a major role in the Pacific Theater during the history of World War II. Today, Fort Leavenworth is still visited for its haunted houses. But perhaps the scariest part of this story isn't the creepy apparitions seen on the military base, but rather the fort's long, brutal history. Places like this that have experienced intense events over the years are often the site of the most bone-chilling sightings. The Diplomat Hotel in the Philippines was originally built between 1913 and 1915 as a vacation house for American and Spanish friars from the Order of the Preachers, more commonly known as the Dominican Order. But the house, which was built at the top of Dominican Hill, took on more historical significance during World War II. At first, the place became a refuge for people fleeing from the Japanese until the Imperial Army eventually turned the property into their own headquarters. The secret police used the place for punishing priests nuns and refugees, often ending with the removal of their heads. In 1945, American troops liberated the Philippines and destroyed the old site, while the Japanese forces inside took their own lives. In 1973, almost 20 years later, Diplomat Hotels Inc. bought and remodeled the building, finally turning it into a hotel with 133 bedrooms. Though architects kept some of the unique features chosen by the original friars. The hotel ceased operations after its manager passed away in 1987. Today, the abandoned building is remembered as a haunted hotel because of its scary history. In recent years, it's become an art center and tourist spot, and has been featured on Philippine news programs, including One at Heart with Jessica Soho. Visitors frequently come to remember the dark history of the place, sometimes hoping to leave with stories of paranormal encounters. Many visitors have claimed to see headless ghosts at night and hear strange noises like screaming, banging on doors, and crying. The building may have been remodeled and used for new purposes, but if the stories are true, then throughout all of history, the spirits of those who did not survive will linger behind those walls. One of the scariest episodes in the dark history of World War II happened following the Battle of Ambon, an event which occurred over the first few days of February of 1942. The Japanese army had attacked the island of Ambon in the Dutch East Indies, which is now Indonesia, and defeated the combined Dutch and Australian troops in a matter of days. 
The Allied forces didn't lose many people during the course of the battle. However, in the weeks following the surrender, the lives of over 300 Australian and Dutch prisoners of war were taken at random near the Laha airfield and buried in mass graves. An event now known as the Laha Massacre. Some surviving crew from a Japanese minesweeper sunk by a Dutch-laid mine in the Ambon Bay took part, suggesting this scary story was partly motivated by revenge. Three quarters of the captured Australians of Ambon lost their lives before the end of the war, and most survivors who remained on the island passed away soon after World War II. In 1946, one of the largest war crime trials took place, relating to the Laha Massacre. As 93 Japanese soldiers were tried by an Australian military tribunal, one of the men was Commander Kunido Hatakayama, who was in command of the massacres, though he did not order them himself. He, like so many other high-ranking servicemen, was sentenced to capital punishment and the rest were imprisoned. During the war, American propaganda in the media reached an all-time high. Some of the most dark and disturbing propaganda stories were aimed at the Japanese. Media often described them as yellow vermin, and an official US Navy film called them living snarling rats. Such thinking especially took off in the wake of the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. These stories, intended to dehumanize the Japanese, were effective to a scary degree. Expert historians know from first-hand accounts by American servicemen that troops often made a habit of taking trophies from the bodies of Imperial Japanese soldiers. These morbid souvenirs often included teeth, ears, noses, and other parts. In some of the darkest moments of the war, the most common and scariest trophies were entire heads, which were boiled down to leave only a grinning visage beneath. These heads were regarded as treasures, each with their own secret horror story hidden within. It was not uncommon to find World War II bases covered with such dreadful decor. They were even mailed home to family with the cavalier attitude of a hunter showing off the antlers of a buck. In one of the weirdest and darkest moments of World War II history, on June 13, 1944, Francis E. Walter, a U.S. representative at the time, gifted President Franklin Roosevelt a letter opener fashioned from the bony remains of a Japanese soldier's arm. Roosevelt accepted the strange gift, supposedly commenting, this is the sort of gift I like to get. This strange but true history story led to outrage in both Japan and the U.S. civilian population. And several weeks later, Roosevelt ordered his letter opener to be given a proper burial. In fact, the taking of trophies had become such a problem that in September of 1942, the Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet warned that any American troops who continued to use part of the enemy's body as a souvenir would face stern disciplinary action. This was only loosely enforced, however, and the startling practice remained for years afterward. This weird history chapter would largely come to an end after most of the trophies were returned to Japan, but the search still continued many years later, and some remains have still never been recovered. It's well known that Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone, but if it weren't for the skills of one man, that accolade would have likely gone the way of Elisha Gray. Louis Latimer was a patent draftsman and inventor in his own right, who played an important role in the electric industry, as our world started to be lit up by electricity. Lewis was born in 1848 in Massachusetts. His parents were runaway slaves who had escaped Virginia about six years earlier. His father, George Latimer, was later captured by the slave owner, but was bought by abolition supporters who set him free. Lewis fought in the American Civil War and was honorably discharged in 1865. After that, he began his civilian life as an office boy at a patent law firm. Lewis was incredibly talented and soon caught the attention of his superiors with his ability to both quickly and accurately sketch patent drawings. His talent was undeniable, so despite the prejudices against him, he was promoted to head draftsman. By 1876, 
he was being sought after by inventors to draft patents for their new devices. One such inventor was Bell. It was a rush to get the patent for the telephone to the office, as Elisha Gray had also finished work on a similar device. Due to Lewis's ability to work quickly and accurately, and his dedication to the job, Bell's patent was submitted hours before Gray's. Lewis had sat up much of the night working on the patent, which undoubtedly secured Bell's place in the history books. Meanwhile, Lewis was creating inventions of his own. He had no formal education, but that didn't stop his creativity or his logic. He worked with another inventor on creating improved bathroom compartments for railroad trains, and eventually began working for the chief rival of Thomas Edison. While working there, Lewis created his most famous invention. It was an improvement on the light bulb popularized by Edison. Edison's bulbs could only last days at a time before they burned out. By encasing the carbon filament inside the bulb with a cardboard envelope, Lewis was able to make the filaments last longer, increasing the life of the bulb. It was the final crucial step into making electric lighting widespread. He was charged with leading the planning team that would bring electric lighting to the streets of Philadelphia, New York, and Montreal as well as government buildings in Canada and London. Lewis would later work with Thomas Edison, representing him in court, helping to draft patents and inspect plants in search of infringements on Edison's patents. He also literally wrote the book on incandescent lighting. Away from light bulbs, he continued to invent devices of his own, including improvements to elevators and a device that cooled and disinfected hospital rooms. He passed away in 1928 at the age of 80. Marosia of Tusculum was one of the most influential women in medieval Europe. But between rumors that muddied the waters even shortly after she passed away, and stories that had been told in the century since, she has become forgotten by history. Marosia was the daughter of the Count of Tusculum, who had control of the papacy and Rome at the time. The Pope at the time was Sergius III, one of the most corrupt in the country's history. He came to power through force and had the two others vying for the throne thrown into prison where they passed away due to less than natural causes. While she was still a young woman, Marosia was given by her parents to Sergius to become his mistress. She was eventually married to a noble named Alberic I of Spoleto. Marosia bore Alberic four sons, but strangely, his eldest son John went into the church. Usually, the eldest son would be one in line to inherit his father's titles, so wouldn't take a church position. However, it would be John's younger brother who would inherit his father's titles, which only added to speculation that John was actually the Pope's son. Marosia's family had been the power behind the throne of St. Peter for a while. And when her parents passed away, Marosia took over that role. Her first husband had already passed away from natural causes at the time, and she married the enemy of the new pope and brother of the king of Italy, Guy of Tuscany. Marosia and Guy had the pope, John X, thrown into prison where he was later smothered with a pillow. She then hand-selected the next two popes who would keep the seat warm until her eldest son was old enough to take the papacy himself. Marosia was effectively ruler of Rome at this time. So when her second husband passed away, the king of Italy decided he should marry her himself. This was when everything fell apart for Marosia. Her pope's son approved the marriage and the two were wed, but their second son, Alberic II, was less happy with the arrangement. An argument broke out between Alberic and King Hugh of Italy after Alberic accidentally spilled water on the king. Hugh slapped him and he went to the people of Rome to start a riot. He claimed the city would perish due to the impurity of one woman and that if the king could slap his own stepson, what would he do to the people of Rome? The people stormed the palace. Hugh managed to escape but Marosia was captured and thrown in prison, where she passed away a few years later. Alberic became the de facto ruler of Rome, 
so any possibility of an unbiased view of Morosia's life disappear. Henrietta Lacks was an ordinary woman born in 1920 in Virginia. She would pass away 31 years later due to cancer, leaving behind five children and a husband. But unbeknownst to her and her family, she left behind a legacy that literally lives on today. Henrietta was an African-American woman whose mother passed away when she was four years old. As a result, Henrietta went to live with relatives and had to drop out of school when she was in the sixth grade to help tend to the family farm. She started a family of her own with her cousin, Day Lax, and the two were married in 1941. Later that year, they moved to Baltimore so Day could work in a steel mill while Henrietta stayed home and raised the children. The couple had five children, the last of which was born at the Johns Hopkins Hospital just four months before Henrietta was diagnosed with cervical cancer. Johns Hopkins Hospital was one of few places Henrietta could get medical care due to her rates. However, there was little they could do to stop the spread of her cancer. At one point, a specimen was taken, and without her knowledge or consent, it was sent to a lab. Researchers were trying to create a continuously reproducing cell line. At the time, medical consent laws meant samples could be used from patients without their knowledge. And researchers had tried to create this line with the cells of countless individuals and failed. They had no reason to believe Henrietta's cells would be any different. But they were. The cells survived and reproduced. While individual cells had a limited lifespan, the line itself was scientifically immortal. It was the first immortal human cell line to be discovered. The discovery was huge for medical science. While the Johns Hopkins Center made no profit from the cells, they were given away to other medical researchers. New medicines and treatments for various diseases were discovered using the cells. The HeLa cells, as they became known, were important to the development of the polio vaccine saving countless lives and for our understanding of how cancer develops. These discoveries meant big profit for medical companies, but the Lax family saw none of it. Henrietta passed away in 1951. She was in great pain at the end of her life. Her children were not allowed to visit, so Day would take them to the park across from the medical center and Henrietta would watch them through the window. Medical and money problems continued to plague the family, who had struggled enough when Henrietta was alive. By 2000, all Henrietta's surviving children had medical problems, and her husband had asbestos-filled lungs. They weren't able to get medical insurance either. With the help of Rebecca Sklut, a biological scientist who wrote a book on Henrietta, things have begun to change and there is more recognition for Henrietta and others like her who made huge changes to medicine without their knowledge. A foundation has been set up to help their descendants. It was a real-life house of horrors. Special containers for preserving human meat, shoelaces, and leather items made from human skin, and barrels of salt mixtures designed for decomposing corpses. For most true crime fans, the setup is eerily similar to that of the infamous Ed Gain, or perhaps the likes of Jeffrey Dahmer or Ted Bundy. But long before these real-life horror staples, there was Carl Denk, known as the Forgotten Cannibal. Denk's crimes had been largely forgotten to history. Having taken place during interwar Germany, there was much more going on at the time that quickly overtook headlines about this malicious criminal but it's easy to see reflections of his crimes in modern-day horror. Dank was born in Prussia in 1870. He was from a relatively well-off family, his father owning a farm. Not much is known about his early years besides the fact that he was a terrible student and he ran away from home at the age of 12. But there didn't seem to be any signs of the real-life horrors that would come. When his father passed away, Dank inherited a large chunk of money, which he used to buy a house. He would rent out rooms in the house, but was also known as a kind and generous man who would let vagrants stay for free. In the small town where he lived, 
he was known as Father Dank and was a well-respected member of the community. He played the organ at church and would carry the cross during services. But with the post-war inflation destroying Germany's economy, he lost much of his wealth. He was forced to sell the house but continued to rent out a room on the ground floor. To make ends meet, he owned a meat shop in town and was licensed to sell pork goods in a neighboring city. He was known for his boneless pickled pork. While that doesn't sound particularly appetizing today, his goods were popular given the economic crisis at the time. He also sold leather goods like shoelaces and belts, sometimes door to door. Knowing what we know of Dank today, it's unsurprising that there was an outbreak of stomach disorders in the local area in 1925. It was December of 1924 when Dank was finally caught. At this point, it's possible he had been operating for 15 years. He'd recently taken in a homeless man named Vincent Olivier. On December 21st, 1924, he went to the police station with evidence that he had been attacked by an axe. He claimed Dank was responsible. This was unbelievable to police, seeing as Dank was such an upstanding member of the community. And Vincent himself was thrown in jail for vagrancy. However, police did investigate the accusation. Dank claimed he had attacked Vincent in self-defense, which was believable enough but he was still put into a cell while police investigated. He would pass away in his cell that night, and police would discover the large amount of human remains in his apartment, complete with logs of who exactly had been the victims of his crimes. Despite the scandal leading to pork sales plummeting that winter, it was largely forgotten. Without documentation, it's hard to say why, but it's possible economic conditions at the time combined with Denk's reputation, allowed people to convince themselves he had been trying to help the community. Or perhaps it was a case of not wanting to talk about something so dark. The fact that this story was so easily forgotten makes it one of the creepiest moments in history. There are likely thousands of unsung heroes from World War II who saved the lives of countless people yet their stories are widely forgotten. Whether it's government officials who helped smuggle out innocent people from access control locations, or individual soldiers who went above and beyond the call of duty, it's easy to forget an individual's actions when looking at the war as a whole. One of the unsung heroes of the war was a man named Whittled Pilecki. Whittled is largely unheard of outside of Poland, and even there, his achievements were censored up until the fall of the Soviet Union in Poland in late 1989. Whittled was a veteran of the Polish-Soviet War of 1919 to 1921, and when Poland was divided between Germany and the Soviet Union at the start of World War II, he joined the resistance. When the Germans set up Auschwitz camp, very little was known about it by outsiders. The resistance thought it was a normal prisoner of war camp, not a nice place to be, but nothing like the horrors that would soon be revealed. Whittled believed that there was more to the camp though, and pressured his superiors to clear him for a mission inside. Eventually, they agreed with the fake identity, and he positioned himself inside a protest march in September of 1940. He and the other civilians were rounded up and taken to Auschwitz. Whittled Pilecki was able to smuggle out information about the horrendous conditions and punishments inflicted on prisoners at the camp. He described physical and mental torture and the continuous worsening of conditions. Meanwhile, he managed to set up a resistance movement inside the camp in the hopes that they would get word from outside to launch an attack and take over. But the word never came. His reports found their way to the desks of the British and American governments as the Polish government in exile tried to convince them to take action, either by letting Polish paratroopers launch an attack or destroying the railway lines into the camp. But the Allies were silent. Eventually, the water became too hot for Whittled. 
He believed the information he had on the camp was too valuable to let himself be taken out by the officers that were closing in on the resistance, and managed to escape from the camp after two and a half years. It wouldn't be long before he was captured by Soviets and spent the remainder of the war in a Red Army prisoner of war camp. After the war, the camp was liberated by American troops and Whittled went to Italy, but his sense of duty to Poland meant that he wouldn't stay there for long. He returned to Poland to gather intelligence on the Soviet regime there, but his cover was blown and he was captured again in 1947. After so many heroic acts during World War II, he received capital punishment at the hands of the Soviets in 1948, and his name was censored for decades after. Today, Witold Pilecki is a venerated figure in Polish history, and he was given Poland's highest military honor in 2006. Many civilizations throughout history have valued cats as a way to control pest populations and the problems they cause. But the true history of the ancient Egyptians has some stories that would be considered especially weird in modern times. The Egyptians believed that cats were the physical embodiment of Bastet, a goddess of protection who, as a cat herself, would have been displeased to learn of a war against her creations many years later during the 13th century. In 1233, Pope Gregory IX made a stunning announcement to the world. The history between cats and witchcraft is well known, and now was the time in Europe to do away with such creatures. All felines were said to be nocturnal servants of evil without exception, and with the Pope's decree, cats were an enemy of the religious state. With this strange announcement, towns and villages across Europe began culling their cat populations and even dogs to a lesser extent, believing that all such animals were harbingers of evil. Little did they know the darkest moments in human history were yet to come. As cats were cast out, the Black Plague was let in. What society did not know was that cats did an excellent job at suppressing the rodent population, who were the true carriers of the Black Plague. With no cats, rats soon spread the dreadful condition across human populations in large cities. People had been eliminating cats and dogs because fleas were believed to have caused the infection to spread. By the time they began to recognize the science behind their mistakes, it was already too late. About 25 million human lives were lost in total to the Black Plague. Although the condition would have likely spread to millions had cats not been eliminated from towns and cities, many historians now agree that the impact may not have been so severe if the unbelievable war on cats had never happened. Fortunately, with the rise of modern civilization, Feline appreciation is surging throughout the world at an all-time high, so the unbelievable events leading up to this dark era of history are unlikely to repeat in the exact same way. Long before Ronald Reagan was an actor or the President of the United States, he was already a hero in his hometown of Dixon, Illinois. The story of Ronald Reagan's rise to fame is perhaps one of the most unbelievable moments in history. Between 1927 and 1934, Reagan worked as a lifeguard at the Rock River, hoping to save up enough money to make his acting dreams come true. Reagan was reported to have worked 12-hour days, seven days a week, to ensure that swimmers in Rock River were always safe. Throughout his seven-year tenure, Reagan had an amazing career history. He saved the lives of 77 people. Every time he saved someone from drowning, he tallied a notch on a log that he kept at the edge of Rock River. Years later, a plaque was erected in honor of his many career accomplishments, all starting with the dozens of lives he had saved as a lifeguard. Nobody from his hometown of Dixon, Illinois could have ever imagined that his hometown would become the home of a famous actor, no less a sitting U.S. president. And in a weird twist of fate, Ronald's incredible history as a lifeguard didn't stop at the Rock River. In 1969, many years after leaving his hometown and becoming famous, Reagan was at a pool party at the governor's house. He watched a seven-year-old girl who couldn't swim lose her flotation device and go under. 
He politely excused himself from conversation and jumped in, fully clothed. Amazingly, Ronald was able to retrieve her from the bottom of a pool, bringing the tally to 78 lives saved. Ronald Reagan remains one of the most well-known and most controversial U.S. presidents in history. His time in office was filled with public pushback, though his talents as a lifeguard remain an indisputably heroic, albeit weird, side note in his historic legacy. 22-year-old Vesna Velovic had recently landed the job of her dreams as a flight attendant. Born in Yugoslavia, Vesna discovered her love of flying and traveling after moving to the UK to learn English. She aced her flight attendant training and got a job with JAT Airways in her home country. Less than a year later, her promising career as a flight attendant would be changed forever by the darkest moments of her life. A bizarre event would place Vesna into the history books forever, and not in a way that most would want to be remembered. On January 26, 1972, Vesna was prepping the plane for a flight from Sweden to Serbia. They had one stopover in Copenhagen and anticipated a four-hour flight. At 3.15 p.m., the flight took off from Stockholm, bound for Belgrade. But just 46 minutes into the flight, history would be made. An explosion ripped the plane in half over Srpska Kamenca. Locals gathered around after hearing the plane split in two. Of everyone on board, Vesna Velovic was the only person found alive. She was in rough condition and remained in a coma for a few days before coming to, after which it took her just 10 months to recover, an unbelievable recovery time considering the extent of what had happened. The Guinness Book of World Records visited Vesna and she still holds the record for the highest fall survival story in history, 33,330 feet, more than 6 miles. The staggering fall had left Vesna with permanent memory loss, and she mercifully had no recollection of what had happened. If you asked her, she would tell you that her childhood history of eating plenty of spinach and drinking fish oil was the reason why she pulled through. In reality, she was at a food cart in the back of the plane, a cart that was later found pinning her down, and therefore she was the farthest away from the explosion that took them down. Theories suggest tumbling down tall pine trees could have greatly reduced the impact of her fall. Finally, her history of low blood pressure could have also kept her from succumbing to certain heart complications that others would have experienced. With that said, her survival story is still one of the most unbelievable moments in history. To this day, Vesna is considered an incredible medical marvel, and her survival leaves doctors baffled. Strangest of all, Vesna was never afraid to go flying after this event, and she continued to enjoy a lengthy travel history right up until her passing in 2016. Astronomer Edmund Halley first predicted Halley's Comet in 1705, only to have it come true in 1758. The comet was welcomed as a world marvel, but a later appearance in 1910 would grow to become one of history's greatest cases of mass panic. Three years before Halley's Comet was predicted to pass the Earth once more, scientists and astronomers began drumming up fear and uncertainty. Newspaper stories began publishing conflicting reports about the severity of the upcoming historic event. One French scientist kicked off the mass hysteria by proclaiming an untold horror story was waiting to unfold, the darkest moments of all time. Not only would Earth come into contact with Halley's Comet, but the comet's tail would release cyanogen gas into the atmosphere upon impact, potentially spelling the end of human history as we know it. People desperately began looking for ways to protect themselves and their families against what they feared to be the greatest historical event of all time. Fake remedies such as nonsensical supplements and protective clothing were peddled as solutions to protect against the effects of the gas. The world started a slow countdown as 1910 rang in. On April 20th, 1910, the first signs of Halley's Comet were spotted. Human history was racing to an unexpected ending, it seemed, and it was no longer hidden or kept secret. Families huddled together expecting the end, but within a few weeks, people realized the mass panic was for nothing. Halley's Comet passed without incident. 
As a side note, the weird history between Halley's Comet and historical figure Mark Twain is perhaps one of the strangest coincidences ever documented. When Mark Twain was born in 1835, the legendary comet was spotted. And when it was seen again in 1910, it was the year that Mark Twain left this world. On August 23, 1914, something bizarre happened a month into World War II, when 4,000 British soldiers found themselves outnumbered more than 5 to 1 by German forces in Mons, Belgium. During their darkest moments, angels clutching bows and arrows descended from the sky to save them from certain doom. Their prayers answered, the British troops escaped while celestial giants held off the encircling Germans. This bizarre story quickly spread through the battalions and the camps of the British forces, and was used as motivation for everyone to fight harder. That same year, a popular short story was published in a London article telling of the events. The general public thought the untold story was a strange but true event, and urban legends about the encounter continue to circulate today. But could the weird history behind the events on that day be a mere urban legend? In 1915, one survivor spoke of a cloud-like formation that swept in between the British and German formations, suggesting a strange weather event could explain their historic retreat. However, another soldier insists that everyone was hallucinating from days of marching and from the stress of being captured or worse. Some say they were sharing a mass delusion, while others insist that divine intervention was involved. Either way, the story of the Angels of Mons is easily one of history's greatest mysteries to have ever come out of that unbelievable time period. As the events of World War I sent countless brave young men into the darkest moments of history, droves of young women suddenly had to support themselves and those left behind. Factory work became commonplace, and in 1917, the U.S. Radium Corporation opened a factory in Orange, New Jersey that would leave behind a strange but true legacy. The pay was about three times higher than any other New Jersey job and thousands of women flocked to work here. But with higher profits came an untold horror that they would not realize until it was far too late. This is the dark and disturbing true story of the Radium Girls as they would become known in history. The women were tasked with painting watch faces. They sat at watch painting stations for hours a day. Factory managers even told the women to lick their brushes to make the bristles form finer points. The material they were working with was a special undark paint, a strange new formula that glowed in the dark. Some of the ladies would decorate their clothing, nails, and even their teeth with the delightful glow, a glow that would come at a high cost and wouldn't be revealed until much later. The paint glowed in the dark because it contained a highly dangerous isotope known as radium-226. But radium itself has a very weird history. The toxic substance was, at the time, touted as a remedy for everything from digestion problems to, ironically, preventing tumors. Amelia Molly Magia was the first to meet an unexpected ending. She developed a long and mysterious history of medical problems as her teeth fell out and her jaw weakened until it eventually needed removal. She, like many others at the factory, mysteriously had problems with fatigue and joint problems. 1922 was when her darkest moments finally came to pass and she was no more. The doctors, who historians think may have been bribed, absolutely refused to blame the factory. Molly's friend and factory co-worker, Grace Fryer, experienced similar medical issues right down to the jaw problems, and she sued the factory for compensation. The men were not given lead aprons and other the men in the factory were given lead aprons and other safety equipment as protection. The women were not. Grace filed a case after spending years trying to find a lawyer brave enough to take on the large corporation. Under court orders, Magia's remains were tested and the radioactive isotope was found present in her body, proving the world wrong about radium and forever changing the course of medical history throughout the world. Unfortunately, Grace would pass away in 1933, 
before the case would reach a verdict in 1938 in their favor. The true history of the Undark paint came to surface and the factory owners were held fully responsible. Of the 70 factory workers who history has famously dubbed the Radium Girls, only 20 would survive long enough to receive financial compensation. On September 1, 1944, Alice Kearney of Mattoon, Illinois, was sound asleep in her bed after a long day at work. Most of the men had gone off to make history in World War II, leaving behind the women and those unable to serve. Alice felt safe in her small town, thinking that the bizarre crime stories she'd heard about only happened in big cities. But September 1st, 1944 would prove her wrong. That night, Alice awoke to what she called a sickening sweet odor in her bedroom. As the smell worsened, she tried to get up to find its source, but found she was paralyzed from the waist down. Unable to rise from bed, she screamed for her sister to come help. That's when she noticed a strange shadowy figure standing by the window who would soon vanish into thin air. Little did the Kearneys know that this was just the weird beginning of one of history's biggest mysteries. After Alice Kearney's encounter, countless others had untold stories to share, each insisting that the events were strange but true. On September 5th, four days after the attack on Alice Kearney, Carl and Bula Kords spoke of similar attacks. Bula later told the police that she found a rag on her front door, and after getting a whiff of a strange smell, she described a similar story to Alice Kearney of being unable to move. Her husband Carl immediately sought out the suspect to no avail. With numerous criminal reports, the press took to calling the mysterious man the Mad Gasser of Mattoon. The townsfolk grouped together at night to stay safe, but soon they began to eye each other with suspicion. Scary stories of the Mad Gasser described him as a man with dark clothing wearing a hat. He could almost be any one of them. As with many small town crime stories, multiple agencies were brought in to assist, but no true identity of the mad gasser was ever found. Some investigators doubted if the story was true or just an urban legend hoax created by Alice Kearney and perpetuated by other townsfolk. Those who had supposedly encountered the mad gasser insisted that their stories are strange but true. In years gone by, the bizarre urban legend of the Mad Gasser of Mattoon has permeated pop culture and remains one of the weirdest stories in history. In 1917, Austrian neurologist Konstantin von Economo published a series of papers that identified a previously unknown condition he called sleeping sickness. Constantine had witnessed hundreds of people becoming ill and falling asleep for abnormally long periods of time. Fearing that World War I had brought about new ailments, doctors and physicians scrambled to treat patients. Over 100 years later, we now know a great deal more about the sleeping sickness that changed the course of world history. But that doesn't make the true story behind it any less strange and bizarre. Hundreds upon thousands of people found themselves hospitalized between 1917 and 1927 with the so-called sleeping sickness. Patients were noted to be asleep for days, even weeks at a time, and doctors were only able to rouse them from their sleep for a few minutes. High temperatures, headaches, chills, paralysis, and physical weaknesses were noted. Some had untold stories of vivid hallucinations during their prolonged period of fitful slumber. It was a truly weird chapter of history. Hospitals were filling with hundreds of catatonic patients who wanted to wake from a living nightmare. The exact number of those diagnosed with sleeping sickness is unknown. Many people made a full recovery. However, some people were left with long-term effects such as mental and physical health issues. By 1928, the mysterious bug had vanished. Today, there is treatment available to those affected and a much better prognosis. Vampires have been an integral part of folklore and other scary stories for many centuries, including some real-life horror stories as well. In 1892, the town of Exeter, Rhode Island 
became convinced that an actual vampire had been living among them. What followed remains a strange but true untold story that history has all but forgotten. In the 1880s, George Brown lived in Exeter with his wife and children. The Browns were honest, hardworking farmers, but just like everyone else during that time, their family had been stricken with tuberculosis, which had historically decimated the population during that time. George had lost his wife, Mary Eliza, along with his children, Mary Olive and Mercy, by 1892. With so many sudden losses, the superstitious townsfolk began to suspect a deeply hidden paranormal mystery was unfolding within the Browns family history. These rumors became scary stories about one of the Browns possibly being a vampire. In a bid to explain this weird historical mystery once and for all, George, along with Exeter residents, exhumed the bodies of his family members in March of 1892. Mary Eliza and Mary Olive were not vampires because their bodies showed no signs of being disturbed. Still unhappy, the townsfolk continued grave digging until they discovered the body of Mercy Brown. What they found in the casket made them recoil in horror. Mercy's body looked the same as it had when she was buried nine weeks earlier. The people of Exeter finally had their proof that a vampire had been living among them. Bizarre and outlandish rituals and practices took hold, and the town now firmly believed that Mercy Brown had been a vampire. Parts of her body were used to create superstitious tuberculosis remedies for her brother, Edwin. Unfortunately, this magical cocktail did little to help Edwin's condition, and he passed away soon after. Doctors in Exeter tried to explain to the townsfolk that Mercy's body had been in perfect condition due to the frigid cold, but the townsfolk were convinced by their own eyes. In modern-day Exeter, the story of Mercy Brown is still an incredibly popular urban legend to this day. Although to the rest of the world, this weird history story remains largely untold. The story of Mary Toft is perhaps one of the most bizarre tales in all of British history. It's a true lesson not to blindly believe any situation that seems too strange to be true. You see, in 1726, Mary Toft of London declared that she'd given birth to rabbits. People flocked from far and wide to witness a poor, illiterate woman giving birth to several tiny rabbits at a time. Shocking tales of Mary's unbelievable condition quickly made history throughout the land. Soon, hundreds of doctors demanded an audience with Mary to study whatever weird science was involved. It wasn't just doctors that became fascinated with the details behind Mary's untold story, though. King George I himself sent one of his personal doctors, Nathaniel St. Andre, to find out more. St. Andre became obsessed with solving the strange case of Mary Toft and ensured that he was there for one of her historic live events. He took a few of the rabbits back to the palace to show King George I and convinced everyone, even the king, that she was somehow the first woman in world history pregnant with rabbits. As the months went on, skepticism began to grow and Mary's true history was revealed. After doing more research on the rabbits, the more astute doctors questioned how they were able to detect traces of food in the stomachs of newborn rabbits. An animal born with a half-digested meal in its stomach seemed like a highly unlikely event. Even someone who was largely willing to believe the stories up to this point would have had a problem with that. Eventually, history would condemn Mary when either she or, according to other accounts, one of her associates was caught sneaking rabbits into her room. Despite this, she still stuck to her weird truth. She would later tell newspapers that her births had been the work of a bizarre paranormal force and that she had been forced to confess that it had all been fraudulent to conceal the truth. Mary lived the rest of her life in obscurity and her strange tale remains a weird point in history when baffled scientists were momentarily convinced that rabbits could somehow come from another species. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts and I'll catch you guys in the next video.